Welcome to Contrast. Richard Bennett, converted Catholic priest, now evangelist, presents Contrast. Your comments and questions will be greatly appreciated. Permission is given to record and copy the entire message. And now, here is Richard Bennett. Thank you for viewing, and I'm happy again to be able to address you this evening. I wish to talk about the accomplishments of John Paul II, the present Pope. And I think it is important that we should look at these accomplishments and recognize that this man is loved worldwide and see just what these accomplishments are. It is quite strange that this Pope who is ruthless in his upholding of his infallible power, who is insistent that he is infallible and that his teaching must be obeyed, and who has proclaimed dogmas such as Mary being the All Holy One, is applauded and followed even by many evangelicals. And so it is really necessary that we address ourselves to the question of what are his accomplishments and what is really the teaching of the present Pope? Where do we find a fruitfulness that in any way matches the truths of Scripture? And this is what I intend to do this evening. I, I want to try to really in a loving, kind way, matching the accomplishments of the present Pope to Scripture to see just what is the end result of what he has done and what is the outcome or the fruits of what he stands for. The world is fascinated by him. His teachings have riveted the minds of men and women across the globe. In human terms, he is a worldly success, and it's hard to equal his accomplishments. It's hard to get one to match what he has achieved in human terms. He has spoken more times, and he has traveled more miles, written more, and made more uh, men and women, beatified uh, beings and saints than any other pope in history. So we're talking about somebody, in the words of a, an internet web page, a news story, quotation, John Paul has logged more than 1 million, 126, 541 kilometers from visits to 102 countries, which is like going around the world 30 times. Perhaps the most lasting imprimatur that he has left is his contributions to Christianity's growing list of saints. Vatican observers credit the Pope with being the single biggest influence in the collapse of communism and the Berlin Wall. For instance, his opposition to Poland's communist regime early in his career showed him as a man who was not just part of the crowd. In his 1980 address to the United Nations, he hoped that there would be no more war, war never again. In recent times, in the wake of 9-11, he has appealed to the world not to equate Islam with terrorism. That's end of a quotation from an international web page. Now, what is the Pope? What is the assessment of him from the Vatican itself? I'd like to quote from a leading cardinal uh, in the Vatican. This is Cardinal Jose Sariva Martins, who heads the Vatican Office for the Beatification and Canonization of Saints. 
he said the following words, quotation, I think this pope will deservedly pass into history as the pope of sainthood. The pope often recalls that sanctity is part of the church's nature, its DNA. And so this of the Vatican says that the Pope is known for his insistence on sanctity and says that sanctity is part of the churches, that's the Catholic Church's DNA, its very nature. The question is, what type of sanctity is it? Is it real sanctity, biblical sanctity? Because Christ Jesus gave a very clear definition of what sanctity is. Is it that type of sanctity? How is it measured in light of what Christ Jesus said? Christ Jesus was insistent when he said, Thy word is truth. Speaking about the written word of God, that it is God's truth. And he said that scripture, that is the written word, cannot be broken. And his prayer was, sanctify them through thy truth. We are to be sanctified or made holy through the written word of God. And so that is very emphatic and very clear in the teaching of Christ Jesus, that real sanctity comes in adhering to the written word of God, like the Apostle Paul said, not to think above that which is written. We do not think above what is written. Add thou not unto his words, the scripture says, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. We do not add to the written word of God. Now what is the emphatic teaching of this present Pope? Does he hold that the final authority is the written word of God. This pope has been emphatic. He it was who insisted on the publication of this book, The Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1994. He had Ratzinger, another cardinal, and the cardinals of the Catholic Church draw up the document under his authorization, and he wrote the introduction to the Catechism. What does he say in the Catechism? He is emphatic. It is not Scripture alone, like Christ Jesus said, but it is Scripture and tradition. I quote from paragraph 82 of this book authorized by the Pope. He said that we do not derive certainty about revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. So according to the Pope, you are to honor and reverence tradition as you are the written word of God. And that was the exact error of the Pharisees. And the very thing that Christ withstood the Pharisees on. And so the sanctity that we would expect from one who holds this corrupted base is not the sanctity that one gets in holding to the written word of God alone. So we have to begin then analyzing this present Pope carefully in the light of what Christ said. Scripture cannot be broken. The truth of God's word cannot be gainsaid. We have written a written word that is absolute. And there we must stand because that's what Christ Jesus, the apostles, and what the word of God declares so emphatically. What are the teachings of the present Pope? These are laid out really carefully in the Catechism and in Vatican II documents in Denzinger, the source of Catholic teaching, and many other sources of Catholic teachings. The Pope has published many encyclicals. 
his teachings are emphatic. He teaches that a baby, an infant, in being baptized is born again through the water of baptism and the words that a priest says. You're born again through a physical pouring of water and physical words said over the head of a baby. He teaches that a young person or a now firm by a bishop by putting the sacred oils of chrism on their forehead, that that person is filled with the Holy Spirit. He teaches that by the words that his priests say, I absolve you in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, that the power in those words absolves serious sin. He teaches that by four words said by the priest over the communion bread, this is my body. That that bread is changed, or that bread is changed into the body of Christ. The bread is changed into the body by saying, this is my body. It used to be in Latin when I was ordained a priest, it was five words, hoc est enum corpus meum. By those five words in Latin, I had power to change a piece of bread into the body of Christ Jesus the Lord. So the Catholic Church said, and so the present Pope says. So this is what we have to begin to analyze. Is this biblical teaching? He claims that from the element that is the consecrated wafer, in paragraph 1393 of the New Catechism, that this element separates a person from sin. Quotation, Holy Communion separates us from sin. The physical thing, the element, separates a person, he says, from sin. That is his teaching. The Communion is also called the Eucharist, and in paragraph 1395, present Pope says the following, the Eucharist preserves us from future mortal sins. It preserves us. A physical thing preserves you as a person from future mortal sins. This is the age-old temptation of man to look to a physical thing to give spiritual life. This is the very thing that mankind loves in his inner self, to think that a physical thing can give spiritual life. It's what all the pagan religions believe. But it is not the message of Christ Jesus or the Gospels. Christ Jesus said it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. It is, we're born again by the Spirit of God and convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But this idea of the Eucharist separating from sin and being the hope and centrality of the Church is the legacy of this present Pope. He has, in very recent times, written a whole paper on this. The Latin name for it is Ecclesia, the Eucharistia, the Eucharistic face of Christ. And he teaches the centrality. I'd like to quote from that document, quotation, by proclaiming the year of the rosary, I wish to put this, my 25th anniversary, under the aegis of the contemplation of Christ at the School of Mary. Consequently, I cannot let this Holy Thursday, 2003, pass without halting before the Eucharistic face of Christ and pointing out with new force to the Church the centrality of the Eucharist. And so the present Pope is pointing out the centrality of this Eucharist. Those who are closest to the Eucharist are the priests. They confect or make it. 
I know from being a priest, I said Mass three times on a Sunday and every day of the week. Sometimes we would not on a Monday, but normally every day of the week. Priests are close to the Eucharist. They say it all the time and sometimes many times on a Sunday. So you would expect if it separates from sin and if it sanctifies, that priests would be the holiest people in the world. Would you not think that that is logical? Those closest to it make it. They confect it. This is not the case. Quoting from the Boston Globe, quotation, well-informed victims advocacy groups in the United States estimate that there are between 2,000 and 4,000 abusive priests in America at this time, or a number between 4 and 8% of 48,000 U.S. priests, end of quotation. And so we have an estimate of abusive priests that is a way above the general population of abuse in the ordinary society of men and women. We're not talking about church people, just ordinary men and women. The abuse among priests is higher and in the general population of the world. And this, uh, these are the people who are closest to the Eucharist. So we see, as Christ Jesus told us, to check things out by thy fruits you shall know them. Christ Jesus said that this is the way. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? Man-made ways do not produce fruit. And we have here a way that does not produce, even with those who are closest to what is said to sanctify the most and preserve you from sin. Now it's with sadness that I say these things, but I think like the scripture says, we must speak the truth and do it in love as we feel for those who are bound to this system. The Pope teaches about these same priests that their power is great. And he says the following in the New Catechism. Priests have received from God a power that he has given neither to angels nor to archangels. God confirms what priests do here below. Now when you think of the revelations that there have been in Poland, in my own Ireland, in different European countries, and in a, some special way here in the United States, in the last few years of the revelation of what priests do here and what has been revealed. And we have this teaching that God above confirms what priests do here below. You would say, should that not be deleted from the catechism? I mean, how could anybody dare say such a teaching? But that is the teaching of the present Pope. And then where does he get these priests from? If you take up your Bible and go through the New Testament, priests are mentioned, but they are the Levitical priests that came over from the Old Testament. There's no Christian sacrificial priesthood. There are elders and pastors and deacons. But we do not have a sacrificial priesthood that ended. As Christ Jesus said, it is finished. And the veil of the temple was cut from top to bottom and the whole ceremonial system was ended. We don't have a priesthood. And he's claiming that priests have this power. We don't have a priesthood in the pages of the New Testament besides the high priesthood of Christ Jesus and the royal priesthood of praise of all believers. But that's not a sacrificial power priesthood. That is one of praise and worship. And so 
those that he is looking to to make all of these sacraments do not have any office in the New Testament and that is quite serious how do you get power for these priests since they don't exist in the pages of the New Testament of your Bible so that is a very realistic way of presenting the problem that we do not have biblical truth we have a pope based on man's traditions now what is so emphasizing his teachings on in that document the Eucharistic face of Christ looking to the physical element of communion is typical of Catholicism you're looking to a physical thing to impart spiritual life this is in fact the oldest temptation known to mankind the oldest temptation this is the exact temptation that Satan tempted Eve with in the Garden of Eden the oldest temptation what did Satan say to Eve in the Garden it's Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 quotation in the day you eat thereof then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil the day that you physically eat then you have power your eyes will be opened and you will know good and evil so there was inherent power in the physical thing according to Satan that you in eating it would derive power and your eyes would be opened the first temptation given to mankind by Satan was to look to a physical thing to have inherent power and this is exactly the teaching of the present Pope he says in paragraph 1129 of the New Catechism quotation the church affirms that for believers the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation sacramental grace is the grace of the Holy Spirit and so seven physical signs are necessary for salvation so it's not just that they have inherent power but you cannot do without them to be saved according to the Catholic Church now the Catholic Church intertwines its spiritual teaching with a lot of political thought and this is part of the legacy of the present Pope he has written a most important political document recently called Ecclesia in Europa the Church in Europe and he is stating many political things in this document and about the Catholic Church being a source of unity for Europe quotation from the document the Catholic Church can offer a unique contribution to the building up of a Europe open to the world the Catholic Church in fact provides a model of essential unity in a diversity of cultural expressions a consciousness of membership in a universal community which is rooted in but not confined to local communities and a sense of what unity um, a sense of what unity um, lies beyond all that divides and so this is the Pope's idea concepts of a unity of course he is proposing the Catholic Church himself to be the unity of the new Europe he gives a message of hope and uses that concept the message the gospel of hope I went through the document and searched it was 40 times that those words are used in Ecclesia in Europa the gospel of hope and you would expect then you're going to find the gospel I analyzed that government read it and reread it there's no gospel message in it but there is an insistent on the sacraments for example 
paragraph 74 begins with the following words. A prominent place needs to be given to the celebration of the sacraments as actions of Christ and of the church order to the worship of God, to the sanctification of people, and to the building up of the ecclesial community. And so the prominent place is to the sacraments as actions of Christ. And so these physical things that have inherent power are said to be actions of Christ. And that is, the lie is evident, because this is not the gospel. The gospel is not physical things. It is a message that was given by Christ Jesus that we were to proclaim the forgiveness of sins in his name, in his finished work, that people would look directly to him and trust on him by the Father's grace. That is the gospel, not physical signs. And so by its seven signs, Rome is attempting to steal from Christ his high priestly office and that of being mediator and of grace coming directly to a human being in Christ Jesus in having it channeled through the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. It is attempting to steal from the Holy Spirit the office of being the sanctifier of God's people, the one who convicts them and sanctifies them. That is the office of the Holy Spirit and the office of the Father to justify and forgive sinners. That is the direct work of the Father in heaven. And these are the very things that are gainsaid if one holds to physical sacraments bringing the hope of salvation. And so we have to analyze what has been accomplished by the present Pope. That it is the same deceiving pretense that Satan has always used to have people look to physical things instead of the message in Hebrews to look unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, to look to a person. Now, the gospel is never more attacked than when it is, in a sinister way, camouflaged to make it look as if it had power and to propose something else. And this is what the Catholic Church does. And it's very appealing. Christ Jesus said there would be many people deceived and many false Christs. The Apostle Paul said that there would be grievous wolves and many would be led astray. The Apostle Peter said that there would be many false teachers. Christ talked about the highway that many would go on. And if we see many people being deceived, we were warned that's the way it was going to be. Christ said that there would be a little flock. And if we see a little flock of God's people, we should not be surprised because that's the way Christ Jesus told us it would be. But our heart still goes out to those many. And the sad thing is that Catholicism has this great appeal for the world. Why is it that Catholicism is so appealing? Because the world likes to have everything on top. It likes, you know, where you can turn things on and turn things off and it's, you know, quite cut and dry. You do this and you get this. You know, it's, it's all fixed out and you know exactly when to stand and when to sit. Uh, it's all fixed. We have an appeal in Catholicism for every taste and every race of the, under the world. To the person who loves pomp and ceremony, we have the glories of ceremonies with rituals, with incense, with candles, with palms, with ashes, and many other things, and multicolored vestments. We have the most exquisite music known to men in the most beautiful cathedrals, basilicas, and churches. 
with stained glass windows. We have the glory that the world loves in pomp and ceremony. We have the grandeur that military men look for in rank and hierarchy. We have this in prominence, where they look to garments to signify what rank a person has. The garments of the Catholic Church, from the cardinals down, the rank is all signified by colors and different significance of pectoral crosses and jewels and bishops' rings. So we have many which the world is fascinated. We have the whole tradition of mysticism where people are supposed to be able to come into direct contact with God and reach all types of fuzzy feelings. And the Catholic Church excels in mysticism and has many mystical saints held up before the world. We have to the ascetic and the person who loves sufferings and penances, we have many penances recommended and ways you can suffer. And we have orders that specialize in sufferings and convents and monasteries where you can go to spend your life in penances and sufferings. If that's what you desire, that is available. To those who love the drama of signs and wonders, we have the whole charismatic movement now right across the Catholic world and available in most cities you at least have one or two charismatic churches. So you have all the drama of signs and wonders. To those who are fascinated by apparitions and all the power and glory that go with apparitions, we have worldwide apparitions of Mary and in every single continent, here in the United States, primarily in Denver, Colorado, Lubbock, Texas, and Conyers, Atlanta, but in most states there is some apparition that has been made known. So we have apparitions of Mary right across the globe and here in the United States. For those who seek the life of pleasures, the Catholic Church has many. It has the annual carnival Mardi Gras where we have the giving into the flesh for the three days before, uh, before Lent begins and the famous debauchery that goes with Lent worldwide and that we had experience in Trinidad and Tobago every year but you just have to go south here in the United States and you get some Mardi Gras in different states. So it is the yearly carnival, yearly par parish festivals with liquor available and we have parish dances and bingo and all types of things to satisfy the flesh in, in the Catholic Church. So we have tastes for everything. Every quirk, passion, idiosyncrasy is fulfilled in Catholicism. So it's the the religion that the world loves. And so if the world runs after the Pope, well, we might expect because he has many attractions that the world loves. And this is just the way it is. The Pope still has a, a presence and he can sit in the wealth of the Vatican surrounded with cardinals dressed in scarlet and bishops in purple and amidst all that wealth and pomp he can receive poor people and the world is so impressed and they do not seem to see the contrast. It's like going to Mexico and see these huge uh, cathedrals and churches and then all the shacks and poverty around it and nobody seems to blink an eyelid. And so it is when poor people are welcomed by the Pope amid pomp and wealth, nobody seems to see any contrast because the world loves to have it so. But there is a clenching part to the Pope's teaching and I think we've got to see it because he himself has put an emphasis on it. And this is his fascination 
with what he calls in the catechism communion with the dead. This Pope has been fascinated with communion with the dead. I'd like to quote from his teaching from the New Catechism. Quotation, communion with the dead. In full consciousness of this communion of the whole mystical body of Jesus Christ, the Church and its pilgrim members from the earliest days of the Christian religion has honored with great respect the memory of the dead. Our prayer for them is capable not only of helping them, but also making their intercession effective. We can and we should ask them to intercede for us and the whole world. That is from paragraph 958 and paragraph 2683 of the New Catechism. Communion with the dead, we can and we should ask them to intercede for us and the whole world. So you are meant to commune with the dead. And this idea of communion with the dead is part of the occult and it has a great fascination for people worldwide. It is exactly what God forbids in the Bible. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. There shall not be found among you anyone that uses divination or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. That is one who calls up the dead. So God says there's not to be found among you one who calls up the dead. But this is exactly what the Pope says we are to do. And his teaching that our prayer for them is capable not only of helping them but making their intercession for us effective, this two-way traffic is quite similar to what you find on the occult web pages. If you want to be so bold, I don't advise it, but you can do it, you can go on the internet and go, for example, to festivalofthedead.com and you will see what the world of the occult says about contact with the dead. I quote from that web page, the dead love to celebrate, dance, and covert with the living. The spirits love spirits, so we invite them with ritual libations. That's end of quotation from that web page. And so the idea of communing with the dead is well known in the occult. But should we expect to find it in a Christian church? Christ Jesus said, about the way in which we are to worship God. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. We only commune with God. In the pages of Scripture, there's no communion with anyone except God. And him only do we serve. To call up in prayer is to serve that person. We only serve God. This is actually the first commandment of God. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. If you call up the dead, you presuppose that they know all languages of the world and that they are universally present. That's an attribute only known to God. So you're giving them divine attributes. And so the commandment of God stands against this idea of communing with the dead. But this is what the Pope has done, and he has elevated the list of those that you can commune with more than any Pope before him. He has approved up more saints and those who are beatified than any Pope before him. I'd like to quote from Christianity Today webpage just before the beatification of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Quotation, Mother Teresa is just one miracle away from sainthood. No, that's not a hyperbole. Just part of the fast-track canonization process that John Paul II is pushing through the Vatican. Last Sunday, 
Crowds flooded St. Peter's Square in Rome to witness the Pope's beatification of Mother Teresa, who died in 1997. Since most candidates are not even considered until five years after their death, John Paul II is wasting no time. But this is not surprising if you consider John Paul's record over the last 25 years. End of quotation. In actual fact, he has created more saints than all other popes put together. If you add up all those who were made saints and beatified persons by previous popes, he has outdone all the others put together. He has so far named 477 saints and 1,300 others that he has beatified, including Mother Teresa. And so he has added to the pantheon of those to whom you commune with, the communion with the dead. And then he says in the New Catechism about the communion that goes on, and it's also called the communion of saints besides the um, communion with the dead. Quotation from 1474 of the Catechism. In the communion of the saints, a perennial link of charity exists between the faithful who have already reached their heavenly home and those who are expiating their sins in purgatory and those who are still pilgrims on earth. Between them, there is, too, an abundant exchange of all good things. In this wonderful exchange, the holiness of one profits others well beyond the harm that the sin of one could cause others. And so the Pope says that there is this exchange of holiness. And this is between those in heaven, that is those who are saints, and those who are in purgatory, suffering or expiating for their sins, and those who are on earth. There's this abundant exchange of all good things. In the Bible, there's an exchange of all good things only in the person of Christ Jesus. That term is what Paul talks about crediting reckoning, that Christ's righteousness is reckoned to the believer as you believe on him. So the term is known to Scripture. It is used 11 times, for example, in Romans chapter 4, the term Logizomai in Greek, reckon credited, where it's imputed to somebody. Christ's righteousness is gloriously imputed to the believer. But other people's righteousness reckoned from one to another. The exchange of holiness is unknown in the pages of Scripture. Now, this is to deceive people so that the communion with the saints can bring you holiness it does not bring you holiness. It brings you into confusion and it brings you into the occult. Because when you begin calling up the dead, like a sister of mine, it really breaks my heart, you begin calling up your own dead. She talks to her dead daughter who was suffocated as a baby. And a Jesuit priest told her that she should talk to her dead daughter, you begin calling up other dead. And you easily have a gateway into the occult. This is really sad because this type of teaching is tremendously deceptive. Why is it that so many Catholics get into the occult? Because the beginning of the teaching is there in the religion itself. What did Christ Jesus say? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way is a thief and a robber. If you're trying to get holiness by some other way except Jesus Christ, you are in Christ Jesus' words a thief and a robber. Now, please don't accuse me of being hard or harsh. I am trying to say the very words of Christ Jesus. And we are on real difficult ground because the souls of millions is at stake. 
And if I am not to speak the truth and reveal, how can it be that those who are deceived will ever find the light of Christ Jesus? Paul went into the synagogues and Christ Jesus withstood the Pharisees. So if I am not to address at present day the lore and love that the world has for the Pope and how deceiving it is, that would be unloving. So we have to see that the most loving thing is to reveal the deception so that people may be freed from it and that it would be really that people would look to Christ and Christ alone. Now this present Pope's legacy has been this communion with the dead, but some other factor he has been for. He has been distinctively known for his insistence on canon law, the law of the church. He is compared by many to Hildebrand, the famous pope who lived as pope from 1073 to 1083. He was known officially as Gregory VII. He insisted on law so that people would be bound by the law of the Catholic Church. And he was the one who led to many more coming after him, like Boniface VIII, and many more, Innocent the third, who was responsible for bringing the Inquisition and the laws that followed from Innocent the fourth of torture and everything following on Catholic law. So this Pope is compared to Hildebrand because he has been iron-fisted in his insistence on law, and this is a big part of his legacy. He is the Pope that will go down in history as taking the 1917 Code of Canon Law and updating it and making it far more rigorous. So he brought out 1983, the new Code of Canon Law, with new laws in it. I'd like to quote an example of one of these laws, law number 1311, quotation. The church has an innate and proper right to coerce offending members of the Christian faithful by means of penal sanctions. One of the laws of the present Pope. And then one of his laws is emphatic. It demands more than any cult does. You know, cults demand that you check out your mind and your will at the door. But they don't ever say it in bold print. I mean, we know that's what cults want. But the Catholic Church says it under the present Pope. Canon 752, quotation, a religious respect of intellect and will, even if not the assent of faith, is to be paid to the teaching which the Roman pontiff, and then he goes on to say when he delivers in matters of faith and morals, but it is the teaching of the Pope that you submit your intellect and will, your highest faculties. And there are consequences if you don't. Canon 1371. The following are to be punished with a just penalty. A person who teaches a doctrine condemned by the Roman pontiff. And law number 1312, paragraph 2. The law can establish other expiatory penalties which deprive a believer of some spiritual or temporal good and are consistent with the supernatural end of the church. Things that are frightening. We don't have inquisition nowadays, but we have the type of rules that would make it possible for these type of penalties to be imposed on the Christian faithful. And the present Pope is the one that has had the iron fist and has been dogmatic in laying down the law that we have to obey him. And this is the man that 
has insisted on Catholic teaching. He has insisted, as he sits among God's people, that he is the Holy Father, the Holy Father, and he is the Vicar of Christ. In the Scriptures, the Holy Father is in heaven, and the Vicar of Christ is the Holy Spirit, promised by Christ Jesus. So here's the man sitting in among God's people, calling himself the Holy Father, and the other divine title, Vicar of Christ. He says that he can give Christ through the Mass, and he can give the Holy Spirit through confirmation. He says that he can fortify people through relics, rosaries, bones of saints, holy water, and many other objects. He says that souls can get out of purgatory as an to them. And it goes on and on. This is the legacy of the present Pope. Now, if you are a precious Catholic, my heart goes out to you because I live under John Paul II as a priest and I know what it is like and I lived where his laws were enforced by the archbishop whom I was under and my own local superiors. I know how difficult it is to come to Christ Jesus because it's not simply that you are in a system, but you are in a system that is loaded down with such paraphernalia that it looks impossible. The Pharisees themselves would blush to see how traditions are so elevated and the world loves to have it so. This is frightening but you must be frightened a little bit more. I remember myself how frightened I was when I was reading the pages of Scripture. But what frightened me more and more was the words of Christ Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 8. Because he was addressing himself to the Pharisees who were quite similar because they exalted tradition and the ways of man to establish their own righteousness. And what did Christ say to them? If you remain in your traditions, you will die in your sins. And that word, when I read it as a priest, <laughs> really frightened me. If I remain in these traditions, I'm going to die in my sins. It is very strong, but we need a strong word in face of a tidal wave of deceitfulness. And Christ Jesus' word has power in it. The Holy Spirit can convict. So I ask you to pray that you would know the truth and so that the truth would set you free, that you would look not to any church. I'm not asking that you look to any church. I'm asking what Christ Jesus himself asked, that you look to him as a person. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. It is God's work that you look unto him. And as you look unto him and you admit that you're a sinner, he gives eternal life, and that is joy that you cannot explain, and freedom. And there are so many of us former Catholics that have done that. In a certain sense, I feel a privilege and a blessing to speak in place of many former Catholics that I know right across this nation and in different parts of the world. The Lord commands you to believe in him as a person. Obey him and know the eternal life that comes in trusting him and him alone. Love to hear from you. You'll see our email address given. And those listening by audio, it's 
bennett at stick.net, that's S-T-I-C dot net. Love to hear from you is always a great encouragement for those who make these programs possible. Most of all, to know the excellency of the power and majesty that is in Christ Jesus, and that you may know that it is eternal life to know the Father in him. And this comes about as you lay your trust on him and him alone, admitting that you're a sinner. And you thank him for both the faith and the grace. And you know that you're secure now and forevermore. And to that King eternal be praise, glory, and worship now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you for listening. If the Lord touches you, we'd love to hear from you. Visit our website at www.bereanbeacon.org. That's B-E-R-E-A-N-Beacon.org.